When I was a child, I attended summer camps, and then as a college student, I was a camp counselor. And one of the critical areas of being a camp counselor was to get the boys to go to sleep at night. They were exhausted from all of the activities, but they were excited. Through trial and error, I found that the best way to get them to sleep was to tell them stories. Walk slowly around the cabin wearing my nylon jacket, so I kind of shh, shh, shh. They didn't know exactly where I was. And then, over time, I learned that Bible stories work the best. You know, you had David and Goliath, Gideon and his army, Daniel and the lions, and of course, Jonah and the whale. They had just the right mix of adventure, blood, fabulous detail, and a moral uplift to be perfect. For the task. And since the boys generally knew the outcome, they did not have to stay awake. I think some folks have tried that similar strategy for sermons, but that's another story. I have come to believe that many of the stories of the Hebrew scripture were designed with keeping the attention of the pre-adolescent mind. The fabulous, the unbelievable, just enough to catch their attention, and then the delivery of the timeless truth about God and righteousness slips in at the end. So if you will, Jonah is a whale of a tale. And what we have for our reading today is the coda of the book of Jonah, if you will, the tale of the tale. It summarizes the moral truth that the book of Jonah is conveying right along. For a quick recap, the plot of Jonah is that God wants Jonah to go up to Nineveh and to prophesy and instead, Jonah goes down to the coast and down to the sea because he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't like these people. He doesn't want to give them a prophecy. He doesn't want them to repent because he would like them to die. So the scripture says God prepares a great fish. It swallows up Jonah. Jonah uh, reconsiders while he's in the belly of the whale, and then he is spit up and goes into Nineveh, which, by the way, is the site of Mosul, Iraq today, if you want to figure that out in your head. So he goes there, and he preaches to these people, and the worst of all possible outcomes occurs. They believe, they repent, they change their way, and God isn't going to destroy them anymore. And Jonah is angry and depressed. He wanted God to wipe them out. So the coda, the end, the tale of this tale, is to repeat one more time for emphasis what the whole book had been about. God loves all people and not just some people. If God is angry and depressed, excuse me, Jonah gets angry and depressed because the gourd plant dies that sheltered his head. Maybe he needed more shelter to keep the sun off his head. And he is unhappy that the gourd plant dies. And God says, Jonah, don't you think I care about all of these people and their animals too? And Jonah admits, yeah, for I know, for I knew that you are a gracious God, 
slow to anger and abiding in steadfast love. So the period under discussion in Jonah is about 700 BC and people think there really was somebody named Jonah. And the time that it was told was about 200 years later, about 500 BC. So why would the saga of Jonah be appropriate to be heard at that time? The ancient children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like many other nations, went through cycles of honoring aliens and foreigners and then cycles of oppressing them. So, for instance, in Leviticus, God says, the alien who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. That was early. And then later, at the end of the book of Ezra, the community is expelling and deporting some 85 extended families and confiscating their property on the basis that they had married foreign wives and had children who were half-breeds, an ethnic cleansing that they believe God had commanded them to do. And this was about 450 BC. Now, I believe that the Jonah story was the response to the Ezra debacle and expulsion. And even if it wasn't this specific event, I think it was somewhere in the cycle of oppressing people. You know, modern hearers enjoy hearing that God loves everyone, and we do tend to be discomforted by ethnic cleansing. Jeffrey Kwan, a uh, professor of Hebrew Bible, taught at my seminary at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley. And in a particular le lecture that I uh, remember, he advised us not simply to ignore the bloodthirsty descriptions of some of God's commands, but rather to confront and consider these writings that are seemingly so abhorrent today. And I got to tell you, they don't get included much in the lectionary, but that's because of modern sensibility. So this is long, but it's from Deuteronomy chapter 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gerashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations mightier and more numerous than you, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them and show no mercy. Do not intermarry with them, giving your daughters and your sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for that would turn away your children from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. But this is how you must deal with them. Break down their altars, smash their pillars, hew down their sacred poles, and burn their idols with fire. For you are a people, holy to your God. Now, we probably ought to consider that some of our spiritual ancestors, the Puritans, were also iconoclasts. And they entered British churches and smashed their stained glass windows and broke um, any statues that they found as idolatrous. Can you imagine 
someone in this building smashing our windows? How would we feel about that? Would we agree with them that that was God's will to do? And Christians, regrettably to say, have been those who, uh, on occasion, uh, conducted genocides. Sometimes people confuse their resentment and hostility with the word of God. And in Deuteronomy 20, but as for the towns of these people that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you must not let anything that breathes remain alive. Anything that breathes remain alive. You shall annihilate them, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Parasites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded, so that he may so that they may not teach you to do all the abhorrent things that they do for their gods and thus sin against the Lord your God. Well, Professor Kwan, how shall we think about this? How does God want us to consider genocide these days? Well, is, is there a takeaway for us from the reading from Jonah that Christian read for us? In Jonah we read, God changed his mind. God changed God's mind. If God can have a change of mind, then we should not be altogether afraid to change our minds. We can do this based on experience. We thought about it one way, we did it that way, we saw how it turned out, and we said, no, we aren't that way anymore. We can also become more generous over time. And this is probably good. I get a little restive when a public figure has something that they said 20 or 30, 30 years ago brought up and thrown in their face to show that they're somehow wishy-washy. And the suggestion always is that they don't really believe their present position. Who of us can stand by all of our opinions of a generation ago? And if I could, would I want to? Or even with the ideas and decisions we made a few years back. My closet has a number of decisions I made a few years back that don't seem to be so grand today. And if we could, would that really be good? We do grow in our understanding, thank goodness. You know, and I think that's really the most significant takeaway for today. If God can change God's mind and grow more generous, then maybe we should too. I think the other is that our ways are not always God's ways. Jonah is angry when God is more generous but isn't that the point of an awful lot of scripture that the way we think and approach things need to be measured by how God understands things? Aren't they to be measured by God's word? I think another way is that God's general character is compassion and love. The psalmist writes, Our God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And Jonah quotes Psalm 145 when Jonah says, 
For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You know, one can find authorization for a number of things if one looks hard enough in the Bible. And the passage that we choose to lift up probably tell us something about our character. We can cherry pick Bible passages just like we cherry pick the internet. I am much more likely to emphasize articles that laud the health benefits of coffee and red wine than I am to highlight the ones talking about their danger. That's how it is. But that said, the preponderance of evidence is that we know that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That is certainly the emphasis of Jesus, both in Jesus' teaching and in Jesus' generosity with his life, death, and resurrection. The message of Jonah, and I believe the message of the scripture, is that God loves the thems of the world just as much as God loves the us's of the world. Amen and amen.